applications there. But thanks for joining me. Uh, and I know that this uh, live stream probably overlaps with the uh, D California Department of Water Resources snowpack press conference now. So a couple of journalists have mentioned that. Uh, so I know some folks may filter in a little bit later during the hour since my live stream usually goes on longer than that press conference does. Uh, I will be talking about the California uh, snowpack. Uh, because uh, you know those DWR press conferences are always kind of funny because we we uh, you kind of we already know the answer uh, as to where the snowpack stands before the press conference because of course most of the data are automated there is the one a single manual snow survey that they report the results from at that press conference but of course that uh, isn't necessarily uh, representative of the whole Sierra anyway and in this case. Uh, I, I'm not sure there's much if any real meaningful snow on the ground. Uh, where they're going to do sort of the ceremonial uh, core sample uh, of the snowpack. So, uh, again, I know the journalists will filter in later. I will be talking about snowpack, among other things, today. Uh, and apologies for the late start. One thing I did want to mention, and I'm adding uh, this link uh, to the chat right now. Uh, let's double check this is the right link. Uh, is an event that I'm going to be, uh, yes, this is, uh, that I'm going to be participating in in Los Angeles uh, on Thursday evening at the, uh, this is following a, a screening of the original 1996 film Twister uh, at the uh, Academy Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, there's a link, this is a public event. Uh, I think tickets are, are pretty uh, pretty reasonable. I think they're like $10 or something. Uh, but the idea is uh, there's a viewing of the original 35-millimeter uh, uh, version of Twister on the big screen in one of the, one of the large, uh, ornate auditoriums there. And then there's, following it, will be a discussion of uh, some of the science in the film, but also more generally uh, how that film and other... Uh, sci-fi and disaster films uh, feature in popular culture in the context of uh, sort of a, a world in which we have both become more aware of disasters globally when they occur with the increase in the information age and immediacy of the internet but also in an era where certain kinds of natural hazards are actually getting worse uh, due to global warming and other things that have changed and so uh, this isn't really a conversation directly about tornadoes and climate change. In fact, this is, that's actually a really difficult conversation to have because it's one of the least well understood types of weather extremes in the context of a warming climate. We will touch on that. Uh, but after the movie, I'll be talking about this uh, along with uh, one of the, uh, the, the people who led the, uh, the actual special effects of the tornadoes in the movie Twister. I will also be on stage with me, and I have some questions for him, uh, because upon rewatching that movie this week, uh, I'm reminded that uh, those special effects hold up pretty well, and there are some interesting reasons why uh, that have to do uh, with using physics and sort of trying to emulate actual real-world footage uh, of, of events uh, that had existed at that point in time. So anyway, uh, if you're interested, there's a link in the in the comments section. Um, feel free to check it out. I will be there in person uh, for the movie and the discussion afterward. All right, well, uh, what I really wanted to talk about today was two uh, related but distinct things. One is a wrap-up of 2023 in California weather. It was an extraordinary year in California weather, but for quite different reasons than we've experienced uh, in, in recent years. And then also talk about what's happened more recently over the past month and what, what, the, what the present and near future looks like over the next couple of weeks. I do want to also have a new Weather West blog post at some point soon, although due to uh, I'm recovering from uh, still, uh, you, my last live stream I was uh, struggling a little bit and I'm still recovering from whatever uh, that was. Uh, but uh, what I would like to do is write a new blog post soon discussing the fact that we are transitioning towards a pattern that will favor much greater accumulation of snow in the Sierra Nevada. So whatever the numbers are today from the snow survey, they should look better in a week or 10 days. That's the good news. Um, 
although not completely better. And why that is, I think, is worthy a topic of conversation. Uh, and yes, I think that that's uh, those are the two main topics. So let me get started after a sip of tea. So 2023 uh, started off uh, it, pretty wild. Uh, January 2023, last winter, you remember, was already uh, the really the beginning of a multi-month sequence of moderate to strong storms, very wet storms, also for the most part quite cold storms, notably cold storms, uh, relative to the past couple of decades, and then again, relative to now this winter. So last year was an outlier in two different ways. One, it was an extremely wet winter. In some places in Central California and the Southern Sierra, uh, the wettest, the singularly wettest winter on record, which again is saying something because these places are pretty wet places to begin with, uh, at least in, in the wetter years. But it was also unusually cold. In fact, in some parts of California, in much of California, last winter was the coldest winter in decades. Uh, so for younger folks, it may have been the coldest winter uh, in their lifetime. Um, but that's more of a testament to how much it has warmed over the past century than anything else, because a winter like last winter, at least in terms of the temperatures, would have been fairly ordinary 80 to 100 years ago. Uh, it would have happened every few years. There would have been a winter about as cold as this past winter. And yet, over the past three decades, we haven't seen a winter uh, as cold as last year. So it is not uh, so much to say that last winter is part of a trend towards colder winters. It's really, uh, despite a trend towards much warmer winters, we still managed to squeeze out uh, a, a really cold and snowy winter last year in California that brought not only enormous amounts of snowfall to high elevation places that usually do see some amount of snow in winter, but also brought accumulating snowfall to unusually low elevation places, even in Southern California, where the snow levels reached the inland valleys down to 500 feet where sea level uh, snow was observed along the north coast and in parts of the Central Valley. Um, that was something we don't see very often anymore, and we did manage to see it last year. Although it is interesting to ask the question of, what if last year had happened a century ago and it had been a few degrees colder? Would we have seen another San Francisco or downtown Los Angeles snowfall? Uh, we, we very well might have, and this might be an example of how just about the coldest air masses that we're able to get coinciding with precipitation these days uh, aren't as cold as they used to be, even within the newspaper and photographic era. Uh, you know, there, there, there's lots of evidence that it, 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 in the early 20th century and in the 19th century, it did at least occasionally snow in San Francisco and Los Angeles. It was never common uh, in, the, in the contemporary era, uh, but it did happen. And now I think I guess never say never, but it looks like that, that, that possibility, at least at sea level in a lot of these places, is probably uh, going, going, gone at this point. But that's a little bit more on the trivial side. The main impacts from last winter, of course, were, well, on the one hand, there were some extreme snowfall events that trapped people in their homes in the, the Southern uh, California mountains, the San Bernardinos, uh, the San Gabriels, uh, as well as in parts of the Sierra at elevations where people were not accustomed to 10 to 15 feet of snow at once. So this was disruptive up there. But the bigger impacts from a lot of these storms that affected more people was the really heavy rainfall that occurred at lower elevations and the subsequent flooding. Uh, widespread flooding, lo locally quite serious flooding occurred last winter with the sequence of uh, wet and often rather cool atmospheric rivers uh, that occurred for really a good four to six weeks. That was sort of the length of the, the wettest period there. And the, 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 the sort of the, the outfall of that was uh, some of the most serious flooding uh, occurred uh, on the Kasumnas River along sort of the Highway 99 corridor uh, and along the Pajaro River uh, it, on the central coast uh, where there was locally uh, devastating flooding in some of the low-lying communities there when levees failed. There was flooding elsewhere, most notably uh, in the southern San Joaquin Valley, including uh, the <clears throat> excuse me, including the Tulare Lake Basin, which uh, became, once again, for the third or fourth time in the past century, a lake uh, and threatened to flood. Uh, 
uh, a significantly wider area than had been the case during uh, previous uh, events this century, partly because the land there has subsided. Uh, as I was, uh, uh, as an interesting piece in the LA Times that came out last week illustrated by as much as three to five feet since the last time there was a big flood there. So not only was this winter really wet, but in the Tulare Lake Basin, due to groundwater overdraft from recent extreme drought, the ground itself had, had, had sunk by three to five feet, resulting in different inundation patterns and deeper inundation in some places than had been the case historically. So the Tulare Lake Basin, in fact, flying into uh, San Francisco Airport uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there is you can still see, in fact, there is still water in portions of the Tulare Lake Basin. I, I uh, snapped a very grainy photo out of the plane window um, it's certainly less uh, extensive and not as deep as it was, and you can actually see the levees poking out above it now, but there's still water there. The ground is still saturated and there's still standing water in some places, um, which is perhaps unsurprising because that used to be uh, an inland lake, a freshwater lake that would persist from year to year during the wet spells. So uh, despite all of our machinations uh, and, and construction uh, to constrain the water, the water still wants to be there. Uh, because it is a topographic low point in in that basin. So last winter we have featured all sorts of uh, moderate to strong, although notably few extreme uh, atmospheric rivers, uh, although there were numerous moderate to strong ones, we didn't really get any one exceptional rainfall event uh, in any widespread basis. There was one exception where a, a near stationary moderate to heavy rain band hit uh, the city of San Francisco and brought that parts of the city its greatest 24-hour rainfall on record, uh, which resulted in considerable urban flooding in San Francisco last winter on that day, although uh, this was relatively localized, so it was not a record-breaking rainfall event in mo many other places. This had more to do with a stalled rain ban uh, right over a highly populated area. Nonetheless, it had major impacts if your home or business flooded in San Francisco, as, as many did. Uh, a lot of people found out where the creeks run uh, under the sidewalks and under the buildings throughout hilly San Francisco. And of course, it's a small, it's a narrow peninsula, but it does, of course, still have its watershed. It's just that much of it has been built and paved over, and it doesn't get extreme rainfall often enough for to, to see those kinds of reminders on a regular basis. So we had that localized flood event in San Francisco. We had the broader uh, moderate to significant flood events uh, elsewhere throughout Central and Northern California. Um, I have seen some media outlets describe last winter's flooding as catastrophic in California, and I don't think that's accurate. It doesn't mean it wasn't devastating to individual people who lost their homes, and people did lose their homes last winter. I will emphasize this, especially uh, along the Pajaro River uh, in, 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 and in some other more localized areas elsewhere. Uh, but this was not the, the big one. Um, this was not California's quote-unquote uh, wor plausible worst-case flood scenario. And this is something that we've worked on uh, pretty uh, directly and, and focusedly over the past few years with the ArcStorm and ArcStorm 2.0 projects. For perspective, in the ArcStorm 2.0 project, which I've talked about before, we had that publication come out in August 2022, and I've written about it on the blog and elsewhere, we designed two scenarios. We designed a lesser 20th century flood scenario that would occur on average every 100 years or so. And we also designed a much more extreme, warmer future flood scenario. And what we essentially found in sort of informal retrospect is that last winter we got about 80% of the way to the lesser of those two flood scenarios. So not to the greater one, uh, but the lesser one in terms of the volume of statewide accumulated 30-day precipitation. So a pretty decent chunk of the way there, but we were still missing that last 20%. And if we had gotten 20% more rainfall in the same window last winter, uh, we would have had much more severe flooding. So the impacts are not linear. You add 20%, you don't just get 20% more flooding, you get a lot more than 20% more flooding in a situation like that. And the other saving grace, as I mentioned, was that last winter was kind of shockingly cold in California relative to recent years. And that actually saved California from much worse flooding, even from the precipitation that did fall last winter, because it was cold. A lot of that water fell as snow even at pretty low elevations initially. And so that helped mitigate the instantaneous runoff peaks and allowed that snowmelt 
to be much more gradual. If we'd had a winter that was a few degrees warmer, God forbid we'd had this winter last year in terms of temperature. This winter has been extremely warm thus far. It probably would have been a much greater flood disaster in California because more of that water would have entered waterways immediately, and there would have been a much more intense uh, spring snowmelt pulse. And although there was fear last year that the spring snowmelt pulse would have been much more severe than it was, part of the reason why that didn't ultimately occur and why there was merely a widespread moderate flooding but not severe to catastrophic flooding as a result of snowmelt on, on the San Joaquin watershed especially was essentially because it stayed pretty cool through the spring. We didn't have a sudden warm-up that melted everything all at once. We just threaded that needle, melting all of that water almost as slowly as is conceivably possible in this climate era, and that also saved us from much greater flooding. So we got lucky last year, and again, I know there were folks who suffered through the floods of last winter, but collectively as a state, I think we shouldn't be looking to last year as an example of the, the worst that can happen. It's, it's sort of an example of uh, what happens if we get lucky during a, a, a really wet year. Lucky with the sequencing of the storms, with the lack of a single extremely severe individual storm that brought huge amounts of water, and also uh, lucky with the temperatures. And I think that was the big one, because if it had been warmer, even just a few degrees warmer, last winter would have had a, a vastly worse uh, flood outcome. And the only other thing I wanted to mention about last winter uh, is that there were a number of storms that brought considerable wind damage, especially to northern and central California. And this was notable because a lot of them were associated with thunderstorms. So many of last winter's storms were convectively unstable. There was a lot of lightning associated with those storms because these were quite vigorous cold fronts. There was a fair amount of convective instability in the atmosphere, and some of what occurred, a lot of the wind damage that occurred, were not so much from the synoptic scale extreme winds because of extremely low uh, pressure and strong pressure gradients near the coast, although that was part of the story, but it actually had more to do with the fact that there were effectively bands of severe thunderstorms that were uh, blowing through, uh, and this was certainly the case uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains where really damaging and, and really kind of scary windstorms occurred repeatedly this past winter, and also with the really damaging windstorm that went through the Central Valley, including through Sacramento, that brought down a huge number of trees and caused a lot of damage. Same thing happened up along the North Coast at least once or twice. These were essentially severe convective windstorms associated with cold fronts, and we don't often see that, uh, or at least not that often in California, although I do suspect that it's probably a little more common than we, uh, than we remember, you know, some of the storms of my own childhood in Northern California, I think, could have been characterized in that way. In fact, we've done a little bit of research showing that some of the big wind and rain events uh, really are associated with a little bit more of an unstable atmosphere than had been widely recognized, even though normally atmospheric rivers in California occur when the atmosphere is not super unstable. Uh, the moist neutral profile is what we would call it in the meteorology world, but that's not always the case. And interestingly, that unusually unstable atmosphere has carried over into this winter, where essentially every system that we have seen so far this year uh, in, in California has been associated with thunderstorms, in some cases quite, quite notable ones. That is not true every year, but last year it was true, and this year it seems to be even more true, uh, as the near shore, shore ocean surface temperatures are much warmer than average this year, and I think that's giving some extra oomph and instability to the storms that have arrived so far this year. So I think that's just about it for the wrap up of 2023. We can discuss that uh, if folks are interested, but I wanna move on to what's happening recently and moving forward. So the past, um, we're of course in the middle of a, of a strong El Nino winter. In fact, before all is said and done, it's very possible that this El Nino event will once again end up uh, right up there uh, in one of the as one of the most intense on record globally from the perspective of tropical Pacific Ocean temperature anomalies. Uh, and that led to the prediction uh, this winter of a tilt in the odds towards uh, a modest tilt in the odds towards wetter than average conditions from uh, especially from January through March, uh, especially in Central and Southern California, but a t an even stronger tilt in the odds towards a warm winter just about everywhere uh, in California and throughout the West. 
Um, so far, uh, again, I was mainly focusing in some of the seasonal conversations previously on January through March because the seasonal signal is much stronger than, than it is earlier in the year. So even December is kind of a 50-50 month. There's really not a super strong influence between even a strong El Nino and December conditions in California, although it's stronger in December than it is in autumn when there's essentially no signal at all. So what has happened is that most of California had a pretty dry autumn. Uh, fortunately, though, not an autumn characterized by numerous uh, off extreme offshore wind events, and because vegetation was wider than average uh, from the, uh, I guess, the event that I forgot to mention from 2023, which was, of course, the a-seasonal arrival of Tropical Storm Hillary as a full-fledged tropical storm uh, in coastal Southern California, which brought record-breaking summer rainfall during August to most of Southern California and even parts of the Southern Sierra Nevada, that really helped to defuse what was already a pretty mild fire season due to the antecedent uh, high snowpack and high soil moisture from the wet and cool winter that preceded it. So, uh, Although this fall was really dry, we actually had a kind of a wet summer in Central and Southern California for the most part, which somewhat mitigated the fire impacts of that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it, has, it was a dry autumn and in many places a warm autumn, and that continued in some parts of California through December, although notably not everywhere. Uh, in December, uh, as the numbers, the final numbers show, there was quite a wide range, and instead of a north to south gradient in precipitation, as is more frequently the case, it was actually more of an east-west gradient, where a pretty good swath, in fact, almost all of the California coast, was either saw either near to above average precipitation in the month of December this year. I know this will come as a surprise to some folks, uh, but especially along the central coast, where precipitation was nearly 200% of average for December, uh, but also even into parts of the Bay Area. Uh, not nearly so wet in relative terms, but many places were anywhere from about 90 to 120 percent of average. So again, near to slightly above average in terms of December precipitation. Uh, far Southern California, so thinking San Diego County and maybe Orange County, uh, were not wet. They ended up drier than average. Uh, but even places from Ventura northward were wetter than average along the coast. That east-west gradient, though, is more pronounced because almost all of the California interior uh, is, was drier than average in December, and this includes the entire Sierra Nevada mountain chain. So that's part of the picture where much of the California coast was near to above average precipitation in December, interestingly, with a real bullseye on the central coast with extremely wet, in some cases record wet conditions, uh, where places like Ventura ex uh, experienced their wettest hour of precipitation on record during an extreme downpour that red led to severe localized flooding. Although fortunately no severe debris flows uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, but uh, where, where the eastern half of California, which then includes again all of the, uh, all, the entire Sierra Nevada, was dry. Even more notably, perhaps, was the fact that this past December was super warm everywhere in California. So in great contrast to last December, which was quite chilly, and really last winter overall, this December was astonishingly not chilly. There were a lot of days in California, even in inland valleys, that were in the 60s and 70s this December. And although a brief warm interlude in the middle of winter is not unusual, I can remember that around New Year's many times in the past, the sustained warmth uh, throughout the month and the wide, the widespread warmth. Uh, in fact, in some places in the Sierra foothills, it appears that this was the warmest December on record. In other parts of California, it was certainly in the top three warmest Decembers on record. Uh, this led this combined with below average precipitation this year to lead to an absolutely abysmal snowpack. In fact, right now, a snowpack, and I know the snow survey is literally occurring as I'm speaking now, but we already know what the numbers are. Just about everywhere is under 25% of average for the date. In some cases, there is literally no measurable snow on the ground at all. What this means is that at right now, as of today, snowpack is at or below all-time record low numbers for uh, the beginning of January. And I know that's pretty alarming. Uh, and I think that the, the good news in the short term from a snowpack perspective is that literally starting today, we're heading into a much colder pattern uh, that will be characterized by some uh, weak to moderate storms. Some of them will be decent. Uh, none of them look particularly strong or extreme, but several of them look uh, certainly uh, respectable. And these will start to drop a considerable 
uh, is considerably more snow than the recent storms have dropped in the mountains. Each of them is capable of, uh, of 6 to 12 inches of snow up in the mountains, potentially more. And there will be a, sort of a, a sequence of them, at least 3 to 5 of these over the next 10 days or so. So that is going to help build the snowpack. We are still going to be well below average snowpack probably by mid-January. So uh, even with that improvement, uh, it may, we may see a doubling or more of the existing snowpack, but that's still going to be well below average, although it may bring us out, probably bring us out of record low territory for the date. One of the interesting things about this winter that I mentioned earlier is that even though there was a tilt in the odds towards wetter than average conditions in central and southern California, and that does include the central and southern Sierra, not so much the northern Sierra, that there's also much more than a tilt in the odds, in fact, a virtual certainty of warmer than average conditions uh, for this winter on the whole. That certainly seems to be bearing out this uh, colder interlude right now, uh, notwithstanding. What that means is that even if we end up seeing wetter storm cycles later this winter, which I still think is likely, uh, with, the ver with the strong to very strong El Nino event in place, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to catch up uh, to average snowpack. In fact, we may well end up experiencing snow drought conditions in California this year. What is a snow drought uh, compared to a regular drought? Well, a regular drought really refers to a total lack of moisture, both in, 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 for in all forms of precipitation, rain, snow, uh, and lack of moisture also potentially arising from increases in evaporation. So uh, high temperatures and low humidity can also worsen a drought. Snow drought, though, is a pretty specific subset of that saying, well, we're not looking at soil moisture, we're not looking at rainfall, we're just looking at is there a deficit in the expected snow? Uh, because, of course, during a traditional drought where there's just little rain, little snow, and high temperatures, you'll probably also see low snowpack. But a snow drought you may actually see average to above average precipitation and have average to above average soil moisture, but have uh, abysmally low snowpack. And that is potentially what we're headed for this winter in some parts of uh, California and the Southwest. Uh, if, if we see wetter conditions, uh, on average, there's still gonna be uh, probably warmer uh, conditions. Again, the next week or so notwithstanding, the rest of the winter, the odds are still stacked towards wetter than average, but also warmer than average conditions. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see a good snowpack. Uh, if you're up at nine or 10,000 feet, usually that ensures a good snowpack, but very few people live up at that elevation. That's the very top of the chairlifts. That's not really where our watersheds get their moisture from. It's mostly from the lower elevation regions. And at this point, there's plenty of time to make up the deficits. Over 75% of the snow accumulation season is still in front of us, but it's not just a question of precipitation. It's also a question of precipitation phase, P-H-A-S-E, and whether it is essentially liquid or solid, rain or snow. And I think that the odds are tilted towards more rain than snow this winter on average. So I do think the snowpack will improve relative to where it currently is, uh, but I, I, I don't necessarily think this is going to be a good snow year. In fact, it might end up being a pretty bad snow year, even if Central and Southern California do end up seeing above average precipitation uh, overall this winter, which remains a distinct possibility because it's likely to be warm uh, most of the time. And part of that is driven just by the fact that the near shore ocean is about three to five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than average. That's a pretty large warm anomaly. So even if we didn't have uh, the long-term global warming trend, even if we didn't have a strong El Nino event, we also have these really unusually warm uh, ocean temperatures right off the coast of California, and that's modifying air masses as they move inland, giving them some potentially some extra moisture, but also uh, some increased temperatures in the lower levels of the atmosphere that makes it harder for it to snow at lower elevations, uh, generally speaking. It does make these storms potentially a little bit more unstable. That might be why we're seeing uh, so many coastal thunderstorms this winter again. Uh, but I think this winter, uh, it remains to be seen exactly how things go. This has not been a 100% traditional El Nino, that's for sure. Um, they rarely are, to be fair. Uh, El Nino has been one of many factors that is important. But as I've been reiterating from the beginning of the season, uh, we've never seen a very strong El Nino event like this in the context of a record global warmth. Uh, due to global warming and the the corollary it's not just that when it's if it were just uniformly warmer everywhere I don't think we would have too many problems with understanding the, the traditional teleconnections from El Nino 
if it was just a, a, a rising uh, tide raises all ships equally, then the, all the spatial patterns would be preserved. But that's not how global warming works. The land warms faster than the oceans and the high latitudes, especially the Arctic, is warming much faster than the rest of the world. And in this year in particular, uh, the global oceans away from the tropics have blobs even today still of record-breaking warmth in a way that is very different than we've seen during previous strong El Nino events. And I mentioned how that had the potential to throw a wrench into things, but to do so in a way that we, we don't really understand very well yet. And that potential remains. It might be why December has been kind of a weird month for many folks, where it was actually quite wet along a lot of the California coast, much wetter than average in some places, uh, but really dry in the Sierra Nevada, and certainly extremely warm. This, for this past December, in fact, uh, was likely the warmest December on record for almost all of North America, uh, or certainly in the top three in most places. Um, there is very little snow cover. Uh, in fact, uh, on, on Christmas and New Year's, I believe, the snow cover was at record lows uh, across all of North America, so including Canada and the United States, uh, at, at any point in previously recorded history at that time of year. That will change this week. There's going to be a bunch of new fresh snow cover uh, across a lot of these regions with the incoming cold storm cycle. But nonetheless, this pattern probably won't last the rest of the winter. And the cold pool in the Arctic, so the pool of air uh, with 850 millibar upper atmospheric, or I guess lower, lower mid-atmospheric temperatures well below freezing, is at its lowest extent in recorded history. So the volume of really cold air that's up there in the Arctic and might be available to take these excursions southward to bring uh, cold outbreaks and low snow levels to places in the northern hemisphere during winter is really limited because of the antecedent warmth. So we'll still get Arctic outbreaks, but that Arctic air this winter is not as cold as it usually is. It's of course still cold in absolute terms. We're talking about uh, surface temperatures in the Arctic that might be, you know, minus 20 degrees instead of minus 25 degrees, but, you know, every degree counts. And as that Arctic air modifies, becomes moderated by uh, sunlight and warm oceans as it moves southward, if you're starting off five degrees less cold than you used to, then pretty much by the time it gets to wherever its final destination is, it's going to be five degrees less cold uh, than it would have been in the past. And when it comes to snow versus rain, five degrees is a pretty big deal. In California, almost all snow falls within five degrees of freezing. So if you shift the whole temperature curve up by four or five degrees, you're, you're losing out on a lot of your snow. And indeed, that's what's happened in the Sierra uh, this winter, where it has rained in December, in the mountains at elevations where it rarely rains in December because it's either dry or snowing. But instead this winter it has rained. And that is, by the way, true all across the West. Um, many places have seen rain at unusual times of year, even though that pattern is likely about to shift. And so I do think we're entering a more favorable period right now for Sierra snow accumulation over the next couple of weeks. So again, this will be skiers rejoice. You'll get a, probably a few feet of powder coming up. Not a tremendous amount of SWE, snow water equivalent, which is really the currency that the watersheds and water managers care about. It'll, it'll be some, it'll certainly be better than nothing and better than we have been so far. But from a perspective of snow water equivalent, we're still gonna be well below average heading into mid-January in a winter where temperatures are still expected on average from mid-January forward expected to be warmer than average. So I would, not, again, not be too surprised if the whole season ended up below average snowpack, but near to above average precipitation, at least in the central and southern Sierra. The northern Sierra could be a very different story, uh, and there temperatures could very well be warmer than average and precipitation below average uh, this winter. But of course, the relative amount of snow that accumulates there in a typical winter is also lower uh, than in the central and southern Sierra, where the mountains are much taller. So, Let's see, um, anything else I want to talk about in terms of the present? I think the, the, the other thing to realize is uh, that we are uh, really uh, trying to articulate how, although El Nino uh, isn't everything, it's also not nothing. Uh, and there's this interesting sort of bimodal distribution in these conversations uh, they've been having recently where some folks say that El Nino, you know, very simplistically means wet and La Nina means dry for California in winter, which of course 
it's not that simple and it's never been that simple. Uh, but also folks saying that, oh, well, climate change, global warming has broken El Nino, it doesn't work the way it used to, or we never really understood El Nino, or El Nino was overhyped to begin with. And I also think that's equally wrong. El Nino and La Nina, as I've emphasized before, are really important predictors of seasonal climate in a lot of parts of the world, including the Southwest and California in particular. It's not uh, the be-all and end-all. It's not the only relevant predictor, but the reason why we keep harping on it is it's one of the only things that we can predict several months in advance. There are other features in the atmosphere and ocean that are just as important as El Nino and La Nina, but we can't predict them really at all several months in advance, and so they can't really feature in our seasonal, seasonal predictions. So seasonal predictions these days still, and I know this is frustrating, but this is the way it is until there are scientific advancements, primarily based on the skill we get from the fact that the models can usually, three to six months in advance, give us a pretty good sense of what El Nino and La Nina are going to look like. But they can't do that for other predictors of, of, of similar importance. So the reason why we keep talking about El Nino is because we know what's going to happen and we do understand the relationship that that is typically going to exert. The problem is, and why people complain about why seasonal predictions are bad, and honestly they are not great, uh, especially when it comes to precipitation. We're better at seasonal predict predictions of temperature, by the way, but seasonal predictions of precipitation are often not very good or skillful, really comes down to this fact, is that we can get the El Nino piece pretty right, but it often isn't the only thing at play. In fact, sometimes other things completely overwhelm that influence, in which case seasonal predictions are often going to be wrong. Now again, as I mentioned, these are probabilistic forecasts. You can't evaluate a probabilistic forecast in one winter. If someone says that there's a tilt on the odds where it's 20% more likely than usual to be a wet winter this year, you can't really just, in retrospect, use this winter to say that prediction was either correct if it was wet or wrong if it was dry. You'd need to evaluate similar predictions over dozens of years, uh, which is tough because we don't have a sample size of dozens of years of strong El Nino years in a warming climate. So really my point here is that A, uh, El Nino and La Nina are not the be-all and end-all, but they are still important, and they're really the only singular meaningful predictive factor that, we, that really helps us year to year in, in terms of what's, what might happen, give us any indication at all. The, the predictor, it's stronger predictor if El Nino and La Nina is very strong than if it is very weak, uh, and this year El Nino is quite strong. Uh, we've never really observed an El Nino event like this in a warming climate where the oceans are all really warm, and that might disrupt the typical teleconnections. In fact, I've, you know, I've had some informal conversations with scientists with some initial data suggesting that that might in fact be exactly what's happening, is that the El Nino teleconnections with these really warm oceans outside of the tropics are kind of messing up uh, what the relationship between El Nino and California precipitation would otherwise be, or maybe what it even used to be. I'm not totally sure that's going to continue indefinitely, but at least in this year, that might be part of what's going on. And the last piece is that, again, as I pointed out, the main relationship between El Nino and California precipitation doesn't even begin until January. I'm looking at the calendar here. It's January 2nd. We are two days into the three-month window, January through March, where we would expect El Nino to exert the strongest influence on California winter precipitation. So hold your horses. We're just entering that window now. And do we see any extremely... A uh, wet sequence of storms on the immediate horizon in the next 10 to 14 days? Not right now, although it's a respectable, cold, unstable storm pattern, nothing extraordinary. But we still have uh, the second half of January, all of February, and all of March uh, to experience the kind of patterns that would be more likely to occur during a strong El Nino year with a strong subtropical jet. And even though a lot of the precipitation events we've seen so far this autumn were in the form of cutoff low pressure systems, even those have been juiced up by an unusually strong subtropical jet. Uh, and some of the weather that we're seeing recently is the result of the flailing of the end, the exit region of the jet stream, uh, from that very strong West Pacific jet extension that was facilitated partly uh, by uh, El Nino, partly by that East Asian mountain torque event that I mentioned earlier, having to do with cold air spilling across the topographical barrier of the Himalayan mountains. 
I know that's a lot uh, to think about, and it's amazing that sometimes when it comes to how much is going to rain in LA, we have to look to how much cold air is spilling over the uh, some of the largest mountains in the world in Asia, or what's going on with ocean temperatures in the tropical Pacific. But believe it or not, those are pieces of information that often tell us more about what's going to happen than just looking uh, in our immediate backyard. Um, that's probably a story for another day. Um, once again, I'm starting to lose my voice, so having some more tea, but I think it's time to uh, check on some of the comments here, uh, see what folks are talking about. So I uh, take a sip of tea. You may see an ad as I read the comments, uh, but I will, uh, I will answer. Uh, just give me about 30 seconds here and I'll get right back to it. All right, a comment from Mary has be becoming convinced we'd get nothing below Donner Summit uh, this year. Well, it's been a pretty abysmal December and uh, November snowpack in, in California, but I do think it's about to get better. Uh, and um, it's just give it a, a day or two and you should see some snow well below Donner Summit. So that's the good news. Uh, Big Sur Kate points out that it's very, very cold here at 3,200 feet in the uh, in the Santa Lucia Mountains. Uh, southern Santa Lucia is right now. A sprinkle of snow later would not surprise me. Uh, yeah, 3,200 feet, um, you know, uh, snow levels could definitely get down to 3,000 feet or below with the upcoming storm sequence. So some of the peaks uh, in the Bay Area and the Central Coast that tend to get dustings when there's snow down to 2,500, 3,000 feet could certainly see some over the next 10 days at times. It doesn't look like a super low snow event and again, the warm ocean, near shore ocean temperatures might uh, put a damper on that, despite what the models say, but it is possible, certainly. That's that's high enough up. Uh, Mary points out, and I think this was in, in response to the storms of last winter from that summary, uh, that friends of mine are still living in a house with blue tarps and waiting for insurance to repair the house after a neighbor's tree took out a part of it, uh, presumably last winter. Um, I think there was, in some areas locally, there was enough damage that I think uh, repair and roof crews have essentially been working continuously since uh, last January, and there's there's still, I mean, a year later, potentially, um, not all of that work is complete. And I know there's the added compound challenge of a lot of folks, homeowners in California, struggling with the increase in insurance rates uh, due to insurance companies essentially um, suddenly realizing uh, what the extent of some of the wildfire related risks are uh, due to recent catastrophes. That was one catastrophe California did not have to deal with this year, fortunately. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, I think this is going to be a real challenge moving forward as some of these big winters, so either the large fire seasons where, where there's a lot of harm from the fires directly or from really big wet winters, uh, where lots of places are, have experienced flood or wind damage, this is a real challenge. And this has been the problem in other places that have experienced widespread catastrophic fires or widespread catastrophic floods, you know, in Florida from hurricanes or in Houston, Texas from tropical storms, even in places like uh, New York City, uh, where there have been numerous uh, extremely rec intense record-breaking thunderstorm downpours, bringing like three or four inches of rain in an hour and flooding streets and basements and cars all at once. There is only so much capacity of one region to absorb all of that at once. Even in wealthy areas, there are only so many repair people. There are only uh, so many uh, insurance adjusters. Even even though usually when things are that bad, people from out of the area tend to come in uh, due to the de high demand. Uh, you know, this is this is something. This is a real challenge. I mean, this is this is the kind of thing that California could face after a big earthquake, a big flood or a series of major wildfires and we've two of you know two of those three things we've seen recently one of them we haven't um, but in any given year you know any of these things is possible and it is something to think about in terms of you know once the immediate disaster has ended there is a long tail to certain sorts of events that can make it difficult to recover financially or even just if you have the money 
if there's no one there to fix things, if there's just too much demand and you get to wait in line with everyone else, uh, you know, there's only so much you can do. And I think some people are experiencing that now. A question from Marnie, Marnie Madsen. Could you please explain the relationship between dew point, temperature, increased water vapor, and humidity? Uh, so let's put it in a, nut in a nutshell. Uh, the water vapor holding capacity of the atmosphere increases exponentially for a linear increase in temperature. So you increase temperature just by one degree centigrade or uh, say, and the water vapor holding capacity, so the ceiling on how much water vapor could potentially be in the atmosphere if it were completely saturated, like 100% relative humidity, increases by about 7% per degree centigrade. It's a percentage per degree, meaning that it, that is effectively like compound interest in a bank. It's an exponential function. So each 7% is slightly larger than the previous 7%. So the amount of water vapor holding capacity for the first one degree of warming is slightly lower than it is for the next degree of warming, and that's and that one is slightly lower than the next degree of warming, meaning that this is this is a this is a, essentially uh, like compound interest in a bank. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's more water vapor in the atmosphere always, though. It just means that the ceiling on how much vapor you can have, the maximum potential when the air is saturated. Now, how, how often in California is the air actually saturated? At 100% relative humidity, you're essentially, you're in a cloud by definition, right? You're either in fog or a, or a cloud. Sometimes it's foggy and sometimes you're in a cloud, but usually the atmosphere is not completely saturated. So that means that there's often a gap between how much water vapor is actually in the atmosphere and how much could, could actually be in the atmosphere. If you, for example, live on a boat in the ocean, uh, then the difference between how much water vapor is actually in the air and how much could be in the, in the air is usually pretty constant. Uh, and the actual amount of water vapor with warming usually increases in a pretty predictable way uh, and with warming. If you ever land though, uh, the amount of water vapor that's actually in the air is somewhat a function of how far you are from a big body of water and how much water there is to evaporate out of the soil. Imagine you live in an idealized world that's made completely of water and then another idealized world that's made completely of bare rock. Well, in the bare rock world, the saturation vapor capacity, so the, the, the amount of water vapor the air can hold, it still increases at the same rate exponentially at 7% per degree centigrade of warming or about 3 or 4% per degree Fahrenheit of warming as it does in the water world. Uh, but in rock world, it doesn't matter because there's no water to evaporate. So even though the atmosphere could hold 7% more for every degree of warming, there, there just isn't anything there uh, to evaporate. And so they, in, in that idealized world, um, and I say idealized in the scientific sense, not that, I, not that we all want to live in rock world, but that, that it is sort of a simplified experiment, thought experiment, uh, you just would see this in, ever increasing gap between how much water vapor is actually in the atmosphere, zero, essentially, in that example, and how much could actually be in the atmosphere, which would be rising exponentially. So that's the vapor pressure deficit. Over the ocean, uh, over the oceans, the vapor pressure deficit doesn't really increase in a warming climate because there's an all functionally infinite amount of water to potentially evaporate, meaning that that vapor pressure deficit, generally speaking, the amount of water vapor that can evaporate is largely scales with the amount of water that actually does evaporate because you have a ton available and inf essentially an infinite amount of water for the purposes of evaporation over the ocean. There's some complexities in embedded with that, but generally that's true. Over land though, it gets more complicated because over land, we don't live in rock world. There is some moisture in the soil. There's bodies of, you know, there's lakes and rivers. Uh, and sometimes the wind will advect or transport water vapor from oceans and bodies of water over land. So, you know, even the driest deserts on earth don't have zero atmospheric humidity. And that's because the wind essentially blows in at least a little bit of moisture from elsewhere. But in general, what it means is that the gap between how much water vapor could be in the atmosphere and how much is actually there over land, that does tend to increase in a warming climate. So the vapor pressure deficit over land is increasing. In fact, there's some interesting and somewhat alarming research that came out just this week that suggested that climate models are perhaps underestimating the degree of vapor pressure deficit increase over land areas in a warming climate. We need to figure out why that is 
because it has big implications for ecosystems and for wildfires and drought. Long story short, that is essentially the relationship between temperature and humidity. And dew point, even though it's measured as a temperature, so you'd say the dew point temperature is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, that is actually a measure of absolute atmospheric humidity. So in a warming climate, dew points over bodies of water increase uh, pretty steadily. Uh, over land, though, dew points don't necessarily increase uh, because the dew point uh, is a function of how much water is actually in the atmosphere. And again, over drier land areas, there's not an unlimited amount of water to evaporate. If you live in a swamp in Florida, that's eff effectively like living in the ocean. But if you live in the Atacama Desert, if you live in the Sonoran Desert, or really anywhere mid-continent, or frankly, not even mid-continent, but even if you're in the Central Valley of California, for example, or in the Sierra Nevada, that might be a water-limited environment and your mileage probably does vary. Um, but just to just do a quick terminology, temperature, uh, uh, dew point, again, is actually a measure of humidity, absolute humidity, that means the same thing irrespective of the temperature. So a dew point of 60 degrees means the same thing if the actual temperature is 60 degrees, which means the relative humidity is 100% and you're in fog at 60 degrees, or if the temperature is, four, is, is uh, 70 degrees, and then it's just a really muggy day with, with perhaps no clouds. Uh, relative humidity is just, a, is just a measure of, literally, in relative terms, how, what fraction of the saturation vapor potential in the atmosphere is actually uh, being realized. How much water vapor is in the atmosphere right now relative to how much could be in the atmosphere, and that's a function of temperature. So you tend to see uh, that as temperatures rise, relative humidities decrease, even if the absolute humidity increases. It's all very complicated. A lot of people get it wrong. This is why I wish on TV they would just report dew points, because it's actually a more meaningful measure than relative humidity for most practical and scientific purposes. Bit of a tangent, but I'll always take an opportunity to talk about the dew point. All right. Uh, A question from Noah Hughes, which just skipped up. Sorry, I have to go back to it. Uh, I don't know the CRMH, I don't know what that acronym means. But was it related to the jet extension uh, via some diabetic uh, process? Uh, just, for, just for folks, uh, that might be a, actually, now that I say that out loud, that's probably a better conversation for a, 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 time, a window where we have a little bit more time since I do. I have to go uh, in a few minutes. Um, although you know what, I kind of missed the meeting here. Apologies, I got my calendar all mixed up today. Well, actually, now I don't have uh, 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 something right after this, so I can keep talking. Uh, so we'll make it through all the questions. Um, I do want to save that for a more technical meteorology-focused day. Uh, when I have slightly more vocal capacity as well. But I'm going to keep going to the comments for now. It's a good question, though. Uh, a question from Kat. Does the local ocean temperature... Um, does the ocean, uh, local ocean temperature cold last year, warm this year, help affect the observed temperature and rain pattern? Uh, yes, in the ways that I mentioned. Uh, warmer years, they add a little bit more instability to the atmosphere and a little more moisture. So storms are both warmer and a little bit moister and are more likely to be characterized by thunderstorms uh, to a certain extent uh, than would otherwise be the case. And it's part of the reason why we're getting so little snow in the mountains. It's just too warm, and that's one of the reasons why. A question from Big Sir Kate, uh, is there a thank you button somewhere where you can add, uh, where people can add uh, or donate a single time or on a recurring basis within each uh, within each um, chat session? I would use such a feature. I think there is. Uh, I may actually leave it to the folks in the, the comments to help uh, Kate out find out how to do that since I actually don't know off the top of my head how to, but I've seen people do it, so I know it's an option. Um, 
I, I, you, I'm sure the helpful folks will will guide Kate in that. Thanks for asking. Uh, Matthew Craig remarks uh, that up in the uh, the Upper Carmel Valley uh, over the holidays, the oaks look much healthier uh, than he's seen in many many years, thanks to last winter. Yeah, I do think it was partly due to last winter being cool, unusually cool and unusually wet, uh, but also the fact that then the subsequent summer and autumn were were not uh, as much of a blowtorch. Uh, even if it had been that moisture and coolness early in the season would have carried over and helped out the ecosystems, but it also helped that the summer wasn't extremely hot and we didn't get those blowtorch, uh, super dry offshore winds constantly. So, uh, you know, and that's, and that's another reality is that if this, you know, this winter may yet have some surprises, I highly doubt it would be an extremely dry winter, but even if it were, at the very least, we are coming on the heels of what was a very good year preceding it. So at least we've got that going for us at the moment. Just for folks uh, tuning in now, I am still here. The audio isn't broken. I'm just uh, just leaving some gaps in the in the audio while I read and review the questions that I want to go through. There's a handful left. We'll see what's here. Um, Question from Lori about with more water falling as rain in the Sierra, do you think that dam releases are, are adequate and being able to prepare for runoff that would typically be expected in the snow? So essentially, this is something that I've uh, discussed extensively, including with folks uh, at the state of California, the governor's office, the Department of Water Resources, and individual dam operators in water districts as well. There is a really genuinely uh, Byzantine very complex network of different entities and agencies and individuals responsible for making different decisions about California water. Anybody who's ever worked in California water is well aware of how wildly complicated it is. And the challenge comes from there is control that varies from local control to federal control uh, to state control. And sometimes there's overlapping jurisdictions and it's not always clear uh, even when it is clear, often there are mandates that, that are somewhat in opposition to each other. And this is particularly true when it comes to dams. Most of the big dams in California either have a primary or at least a, a, a major secondary flood control mandate, meaning that they are operated not necessarily uh, just to provide uh, a st st storage of, of potable water, or not even primarily for that purpose in some cases, but primarily to offer flood control, to buffer flood flows, to control how much water, how quickly it gets released, and when downstream of the dam. There's challenges with that because mitigating flooding is a different goal than maximizing water supply. So if you were just trying to maximize water supply, you'd, leave, you'd always leave the dam completely full, right? You'd never let any water out. But of course, for safety reasons and for flood control reasons, that would be a terrible decision because then you would then put the dam at risk of a structural crisis. Uh, if a big storm came along when it was already full and it started overtopping, or you couldn't lose the water as quickly as it was coming in, so you always need some headroom to prevent that. And you know, you, you would also then potentially have the situation where during the middle of a really big storm is when you'd suddenly need to release all this water, so you'd actually be increasing peak flood flows rather than decreasing them, because not only would you have the water that was naturally entering the river downstream from runoff, but you'd have the extra runoff that you'd accumulated in the dam that you did for safety reasons and have to empty right in the middle of the storm. So these dams in California, a lot of them, a lot of the ones, especially on the west side of the Sierra Nevada that were built for, with a major water conservation purpose in mind, were designed to capture not huge flood flows during really big warm winter storms, but more gradual snowmelt that's incremental through the spring and summer months. And the reason why they can better do that is you generally don't lose the snowpack all at once. It's more predictable, it's more seasonal, except that now the seasonality is changing in a warming climate. It's no longer happening in late spring and into summer. It is happening in early spring. And sometimes it's even happening in winter. 
And we expect that shift to continue to occur where the runoff peak may actually end up occurring instead of happening in late spring in some of these watersheds will happen in winter, which is a problem because then that coincides with when we do get big storms sometimes. And so the competing flood control and water supply mandates mean that you operate some of this water infrastructure in almost diametrically opposed ways. The ma maximally risk averse from flood control perspective is to always have an empty reservoir. Maximally risk averse from a drought perspective is to always have a full reservoir. Obviously we can't do either of those things because the risk is too high of having a big problem on one end of the spectrum or other. So we gotta, we gotta meet in the middle somewhere. But all of this sort of centers on where, where is the middle on this? And there is there are a lot of challenges here. There's some progress. There's now something called forecast informed reservoir operations where you can uh, essentially, instead of assuming we have no information about what, what storms might or might not be coming next, you assume we do have some reasonable information about whether or not there's going to be a big storm in the near future and we can operate uh, the system more strategically. This is something that's been implemented at several dams in California and will likely roll out to more of them in the future. This is sort of a marriage of weather prediction, hydrology, and uh, dam operations, which is actually quite a feat given all of the moving pieces that have to be involved and all of the regulatory hurdles. It's kind of amazing that this is actually happening at all and that it looks like it is successful and will probably expand. But again, this is helping at the margins. It's still me. You still got to leave a good amount of headroom and you still have to be risk averse. And so the water infrastructure we have is going to be increasingly out of alignment with the climate that we have. This is the, just the, the, the real fundamental reality. Um, I think the, the real challenge is, is, is going to be how do we manage this increase in hydroclimate whiplash and these increasingly wide swings between drought and flood. And uh, really right now, the answer is that we, we, we don't have a system that's, that's, that's able easily to accommodate that. Some of the solutions we've talked about are expanding floodplains strategically rather than, rather than constraining them, uh, restoring floodplains, uh, strengthening some flood control infrastructure, but pulling back on others in strategic places that allow water to uh, quote unquote do its thing, but in a semi-controlled way, uh, controlled not in a very direct way, but sort of by corralling it into not flooding the places we really, really don't want it to flood during the big events, which gives us more leeway the rest of the time. Uh, and has the benefit of, of restoring ecosystems as well. That groundwater banking, storing more water underground. Uh, hopefully there's been some momentum towards that. There's certainly a lot of discussion around it, but the reality is in the Central Valley, for the most part, overdraft continues. We're still pumping, the ground is still subsiding faster than we're replenishing those aquifers through recharge. So there's a long way to go. And that's probably another conversation that's better saved uh, at least the details for a, a longer, uh, a longer, a longer day, a, a longer office hour, a different office hour. Uh, but definitely, uh, it's sort of an interesting question to have in the context of this year, where we might end up with a decent water year as viewed from a, the perspective of overall precipitation. I still think that's quite plausible, or even an above average water year, at least in central and southern California. But we may not see a good snowpack in that same year because of warmth. What does that mean for water supply? What does that mean for how we've designed our water systems? I think there's gonna be more conversation to come on that front. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Okay, yeah, thanks to StormSurf. I guess I need to do something on the admin side uh, to enable uh, to enable that the, the uh, that feature in chat. So I'll have to, uh, maybe next time that'll be enabled. I'll, I'll take a look at that right after I'm done here. Thanks for that. All right. Um, 
looks like uh, I think we made it through most of the good most of the uh, questions that I'm able to answer in the time we've got available today. So uh, thanks everybody, uh, and I do think that the the snow situation will improve in the short term. There's some pretty robust looking cold storms. Nothing extreme, but certainly respectable in the context of this winter coming up. Uh, a sequence of storms that th these may produce some occasional uh, heavy rain and gusty winds along the coast too. So these will be decent storms. Again, it wouldn't be too surprised to see yet more thunderstorms with some of these, as you've seen with essentially every system this winter. Uh, and I will try and have a blog post, uh, possibly Friday uh, this week, um, Wednesday, uh, possibly tomorrow, possibly Friday uh, this week. That'll be my goal. Uh, but uh, Happy New Year, everybody. And uh, I, I think that's all I've got for you today. So uh, check out Weather West for that update coming up. Uh, I'm, I'm all across uh, social media. If you're in LA and interested in the event I mentioned at, at the beginning at the Academy Museum following a viewing of the movie Twister uh, this Thursday evening, uh, check it out in the very first link in the chat uh, from today's conversation. Uh, it's a public event. I think to, my understanding is that tickets are affordable. Uh, but otherwise, uh, see you all next time. And uh, hopefully there'll be uh, a more uh, El Nino-like pattern to talk about then. Uh, but at the very least, the, the mountains are going to get some snow over the next 10 days. Uh, won't erase the deficit, but I think we will be in better shape 10 or 15 days from now than we are at the moment. So with that, I will... Bid everyone goodbye.